Center for Internet Society for having us here. It's our first time in Bangalore, so I'm uh, really excited. And um, thanks to all of you for being our audience. So, uh, as Maria noted, today we'll talk about uh, kind of the general program areas for the Citizen Lab and also some of our current research on uh, censorship and surveillance around the world. So, uh, the Citizen Lab is an interdisciplinary laboratory based at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Uh, we were founded in 2001 by our director, Ron Deaver. And um, at a high level, we focus on three main areas. Uh, research, which we'll primarily talk about today, uh, capacity building, and policy engagement. So I'll just briefly, sorry, I'll just uh, briefly go over our uh, programs in capacity building and policy engagement that we'll get into the research. So throughout uh, the history of the Citizen Lab, uh, we have engaged in capacity building by helping form and support research networks based in the Global South. And uh, the collaboration with these partners is really crucial for the research that we do. Um, one primary example of that is uh, a project uh, that we helped start called the Open Net Initiative, um, which is an inter-university consortium that was started in the early 2000s uh, between ourselves at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm sorry. Um, ourselves at the University of Toronto Harvard uh, University and um, the University of Cambridge. And the objective of the Open Net Initiative is to document internet filtering around the world. And to do that properly, uh, we really depend on expertise from uh, researchers and advocates uh, in the regions and countries that we're looking at. Um, so to help create that collaboration uh, with those kinds of individuals, uh, we help form and support two networks. Uh, the first network is called Open Net Eurasia. Uh, that includes a diverse range of lawyers, researchers, practitioners uh, from across the Commonwealth of Independent States region. And um, that network was really started at the beginning of the Open Net Initiative uh, around 2003. Uh, another network that we started in 2007 with the support of the uh, International Development Research Center in Canada is called Open Net Asia. And um, similar to Open Net Eurasia, that includes uh, researchers and advocates from across um, the Asian region working on surveillance and uh, censorship. So the interaction with these networks is really complementary. Um, they add important context uh, and expertise into the research we're doing and um, we collaborate with them to help build capacity on uh, research and advocacy in those regions. Uh, recently, again with the support of the International Development Research Center, we started a new network called the, the Cyber Stewards Network. And uh, this name plays on the concept of stewardship and explores what an ethic of responsible behavior uh, is in a shared communication space like the internet. So unlike our previous networks, um, which were regional, this network is global and includes partners from Asia, Africa, Middle East and North Africa, and Latin America. And uh, Center for Internet Society is uh, one of the partners in that network. And together, um, what we're trying to do is articulate what cybersecurity means um, for the partners uh, from the context of their country and region and try to build out a, a dialogue and a conversation about it that is coming from the Global South uh, rather than a transatlantic dialogue, which really um, dominates uh, current discourse around cybersecurity. So that's our policy, or sorry, that's our capacity building area. On um, policy engagement, we're doing a number of things. Um, just briefly tell about one of our most um, important aspects of that program, uh, which is an annual conference we have uh, every March in uh, Toronto. We're just going into next year to have our fourth installment of it called the Cyber Dialogue. And uh, the purpose of the Cyber Dialogue is to have a forum where stakeholders from government, private sector, academia, and civil society can come together to discuss pressing issues around internet governance and security and um, helps uh, create a trusted space where we can exchange uh, ideas and, um, and dialogue around, uh, around these issues. So the focus today is um, our research on surveillance and censorship. And a kind of signature of the lab that I think um, makes our research stand out a bit uh, from other groups is our approach to this research area, which uh, we consider kind of mixed methods approach that combines uh, rigorous technical uh, investigations with methodologies from social science and also analysis um, from uh, legal and policy areas. And uh, we combine all of this together to get a more holistic sense of uh, what's happening on the internet and other information communication technologies. So 
So one of the um, prime focuses for us uh, with this method is information controls. And uh, we define information controls as actions conducted in and through information communication technologies that seek to deny, disrupt, manipulate, or monitor information uh, for political ends. So to better uh, capture what we mean by that, I'll just show you a selection of um, some information controls. And each one of these uh, categories of them have a different objective. Um, so some information controls are designed to deny information. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the most common examples of information denial is uh, internet censorship. So in many countries around the world, when you try to access uh, certain content online, you're greeted with a block page. Um, and these are some examples of block pages around the world. And uh, countries differ in what they uh, put on their block pages or uh, and how they implement filtering. So this is an example from Saudi Arabia uh, that I think is interesting. So it says access to this uh, URL is not allowed. Um, but then it gives a, a kind of uh, ability for the user to interact um, with the authorities uh, around the censorship. So it says, uh, please fill out the form below if you believe the requested page should not be blocked. And then there's a link for doing that. And then underneath that it says, please send other sites you feel should be blocked using the following form. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of interesting because it gives you know some level of transparency and some way for users to um, give feedback uh, to authorities. Um, in other countries, uh, users may not even see a block page, um, and when they try to access uh, filtered content, uh, the page is simply hanging. They might get what appears to be a 404 error or, or, or other uh, indications that don't give any real sense that this page has been intentionally blocked by authorities and may appear to be some kind of conventional uh, network error. So uh, as I mentioned before, we've been doing a lot of research on internet filtering for really the past decade as part of the Open Net Initiative and, um, and within our group. And when uh, we started the Open Net Initiative when our, with our partners and first started our research in this area, really only a handful of countries were um, conducting internet filtering. Uh, since that time, we've tested for internet filtering in over 74 countries around the world and have found that 42 states, including importantly both democratic and authoritarian states, uh, have some level of filtering present. And that's just within our sample. Um, there may be more countries beyond that. So what we feel we've witnessed in the past 10 years of doing this research is a steady increase of filtering around the world and really see internet censorship as becoming a growing and pervasive uh, global norm. So just as there's many different ways of implementing filtering technically and many different ways of communicating that filtering to users, uh, there's also many different reasons why states um, may implement filtering, what their motivations for it are. Um, so these are some of the most common ones we see, uh, appeals to national security, appeals to public morality, uh, can also be based on economic interests, uh, concerns around copyright, um, and also in some cases to control political dissent in the country. So internet filtering is just one example of uh, information denial. Um, there's many others, just to point out two that uh, we're very interested in. Um, one is uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, and just at a basic level, this is when uh, your website is flooded with more requests than it can handle, and um, which effectively disrupts access to that website at, at uh, that point period. And this has been used uh, as a tactic for cybercrime and, and uh, in other instances that are not politically motivated. Um, what we're interested in is when a website um, will become under these attacks and what period um, that is happening. So for example, it might be the website of an opposition political party during an election. Um, so at a period when their information is the most valuable, when they're trying to reach uh, the greatest audience and most users, and all of a sudden their website comes under a uh, denial of service attack, they're not able to distribute that information anymore. Or it might be the website of an activist group around a sensitive anniversary um, of a political event, and right when they're doing their heightened amount of campaigning, they want to reach uh, the widest audience, and their website uh, is not able to uh, serve content. Um, importantly, information can be denied in ways that are non-technical, so uh, the use of law and regulation uh, to censor content online, broad use of libel and slander law um, are just examples of, of how that can be done. So that's kind of the information denial uh, category. Other kinds of information controls uh, 
seek to manipulate information or to project a message uh, that might be counter to what a user or an organization is trying to convey on the internet. Um, so these are just two examples. Uh, one's called a defacement <coughs> attack. In a defacement attack, uh, a website is compromised, it's broken into, and the visual content of the site is changed. Uh, and again, we've seen um, uh, this tactic used in um, cybercrime, we've seen it used as um, a kind of uh, digital graffiti on the internet. Sometimes attackers will compromise a site and put up a humorous message to show, you know, we popped your website and, um, you know, this is my handle. Uh, but increasingly we've seen it being used uh, politically motivated attacks. So this is, is, a, is an example from 2008. Um, the website of Siren Wosser, who's a prominent Tibetan blogger, uh, was compromised and defaced by attackers based in China, and they left um, this image uh, behind instead of her usual website content. And the headline of this defacement reads, uh, Long live the People's Republic of China, down with all Tibetan independence elements. So in this case, you can see how um, the website of a prominent blogger and activist is um, vandalized, essentially, with a message that goes against um, what her website is trying to convey. Uh, recently, we've been tracking the activities of a group called uh, the Syrian Electronic Army, um, which is a group active online, which is uh, pro-Assad uh, regime in Syria, and they've been very active um, uh, during all of the events in Syria. Um, some of their activities include uh, defacing websites and uh, leaving messages uh, that are pro-regime. So this is one of the more high-profile websites uh, that they're able to break into and leave a message on uh, of Harvard University. Um, and we've been tracking these um, for a couple of years. Another thing uh, that this group does is spread pro-regime messages on social media. So this is an example of uh, President Obama's uh, Facebook page uh, and a stream of messages that are uh, pro-regime uh, coming in that the group claims they organized. So, that was the uh, information manipulation category, and then we moved to another category um, that we really have a lot of research uh, going on and is um, an object of uh, uh, concern for us, which is information monitoring. Um, so, information can be monitored in a number of different ways. Uh, passive surveillance, which you see there, uh, refers to the mass collection of information. So the recent leaks around uh, the NSA's prison program of mass surveillance is a good example of this kind of monitoring. Um, our research uh, in the past years has been focused on another kind of surveillance, uh, which is in the form of targeted malware. Uh, so what is targeted malware? Targeted malware is malware attacks that are designed to target specific individuals or groups. Uh, usually this is done through uh, an email. Uh, it can be addressed uh, specifically to the individual or to the group. It has content that is relevant for what they're doing. Uh, for example, if you're a Tibetan activist, it might uh, reference a current campaign around uh, the Tibetan movement or uh, an event of interest. And what the message is trying to make you do is open a document or a link uh, that contains malware. So what does the malware do? So if you compare targeted malware um, to other more routine malware attacks that are going after, say, your banking information uh, or your password to uh, your bank account, uh, this malware is different. Uh, the objective of targeted malware is essentially to steal files, spy on users through their um, peripheral devices, through their webcam, through their microphones, to record your keystrokes, and to do this over a long period of time and to maintain persistent presence on networks and do it silently. So really, the objective of targeted malware is to spy on users, spy on your computer, spy on the networks of your organization. Uh, importantly, these kinds of attacks are not isolated. They're campaigns. And if you are uh, an individual user or belong to a group that is under attack from a targeted malware campaign, you are getting consistent attempts to compromise your network all the time. Uh, these kind of attacks affect governments, they affect big business, and they affect civil society. So our interest in targeted malware and its effects on civil society and uh, the greater effects on international relations really peaked with uh, this report tracking GhostNet from 2009, uh, which was led by uh, our colleagues Arif Villeneuve and Craig Walton. And uh, this report started here in India, um, in Dharamsala, with uh, the Tibetan community. 
And uh, Greg Walton, uh, our colleague, had been working with that community for um, a number of years. And uh, for this report, he conducted uh, the collection of technical samples from Tibetan institutions uh, that had concerns uh, regarding computer security. Uh, these institutions included uh, the private office of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, the Tibetan government in exile, and a number of uh, Tibetan non-governmental organizations. Uh, so through uh, this field work and lab investigations conducted by NARP building, we uncovered a massive cyber espionage network uh, with a reach that went uh, beyond the Tibetan community. Um, so the way that this network worked was it was enabled through targeted malware. And what the attackers did is they used socially engineered emails to lure uh, target victims into clicking on attachments uh, that contained malware and then gaining control over the compromised system. So what you see here is a real example that was used in one of the attacks. Uh, you can see um, the message is professionally written. It's um, uh, related to issues uh, in the Tibetan community. Um, and if you're working uh, within this community and on these issues, it might look like a message that uh, you would click. If a user then clicked the attachment, um, it would compromise the computer and download a uh, remote access trojan called GhostRat, which gives the attacker real-time control over the compromised system. So this is the um, user interface that the attacker would see for GhostRat. GhostRat is actually an open source program. You could download it right now and probably Google for it. Um, and it's a, what's referred to as a remote access trojan, which essentially gives a remote user um, full control over a target computer. So you can see the commands that the attackers could do. They could steal files, they could do screen captures, they could uh, run a keylogger to record all of the keystrokes, uh, they could turn on the microphone, they could turn on the webcam. So they essentially turn um, the computer of the user into a um, you know, feature-rich spying tool for them. So uh, as I noted, uh, the institutions in the Tibet community were compromised by this malware, um, but what we're able to find through our technical investigation is that actually 1,295 uh, computers were infected by this malware in over 103 countries. Significantly, close to 30% of the infected computers can be considered high-value targets, and this included ministries of foreign affairs for countries around the world, including Iran, Bangladesh, Latvia, Indonesia, Philippines, Brunei, Barbados, embassies of India, South Korea, Indonesia, Romania, Cyprus, Malta, Thailand, the list goes on. Um, so the malware used in these attacks communicated back to servers uh, based in China. Uh, however, we're not able to conclusively determine uh, the identity of the attackers uh, behind this campaign. Um, or what their link may or may not be to uh, the government of China. Uh, but given the, the high value targets that you see listed here, a selection of them, and the capabilities that they had um, through the program I just showed you, uh, we definitely concluded that the objective of this network was political espionage. So that was in 2009. Uh, we've been continuing this work since then, and uh, what we really are focusing on are what is the impact of these kinds of attacks on civil society? And civil society is very much under threat um, from targeted malware and the whole list of other information controls um, that I listed there. So we've been running a study for the past two years where we've been enrolling a diverse range of um, human rights groups and other groups uh, from civil society communities and collecting uh, technical samples from them of targeted malware attacks like the one I just showed you, uh, running interviews with them and surveys to understand the context behind these attacks, how do they use technology in their everyday um, workflow and how do these kind of threats um, affect what they're doing, affect the campaigns they're doing, uh, what impact does it have on the organizations. And so we're trying to analyze uh, the technical, social, and political dimensions of the threats and really address a kind of lack of research attention to civil society. Uh, these kinds of attacks have hit really big targets from Google, RSA, governments around the world, uh, entities that have a lot of resources and uh, financial capability to run investigations, to hire companies to do incident response. 
Um, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you have civil society groups. Some of these groups may not have a physical office. They may not have a system administrator. They might be literally five people with laptops work, working out of their homes. Uh, and yet they're as targeted or perhaps even more targeted um, than groups with um, much more re resources. So what we're trying to do uh, in this work is raise awareness of these threats. Uh, put out information that we hope can be used both within civil society communities and help inform a broader community uh, outside of them. So we'll have a comprehensive report on the last two years of this work uh, coming out by the end of the summer. So uh, another kind of dimension to all of those threats uh, that I showed you, that selection of them, is the market and use of commercial filtering and surveillance products that can enable it. And uh, I'll turn now to Jacob, uh, who's doing a lot of work, particularly on uh, commercial products that enable internet filtering. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is just a sample of some of the companies that we've been looking at uh, in the last uh, five or so years of doing this sort of work uh, that provide uh, filtering <coughs> products to be used worldwide. Uh, Fortinet's from Germany, Luco WebSense is from America, and NetSweeper is actually based out of Canada. And uh, so I'd like to go through some of the general methodology that we use to fingerprint and find different filtering devices all across the world. Uh, the first is the most uh, straightforward, which is just a straight scan for signatures. So we have some idea. We look at installations of uh, the products in other places. We have a look at how they would look like from the outside, and we just look for it uh, by just scanning. Uh, there's a lot of problems with this sort of methodology. Uh, for one, it doesn't scale at all. If you don't have a good idea about where to look, the chances of you finding it are very slim. And it takes a long time, and again, is if it's not narrowed down, it might take you know days, weeks, months. And the other one is uh, you also have to sort through a lot of false data because you basically have to scan computers that have nothing to do with filtering in order to get to that sort of thing. So it's a problem that uh, uh, this is one of the, the things that we've done. But uh, we've actually yielded some interesting results uh, doing uh, targeted scanning uh, based on uh, information that we receive from in country. Uh, an example of this is this, which is a traffic graph interface that was installed on the ISP of the Syria Computer Society, which was an ISP with, which was uh, linked to the Assad regime. Uh, and in late 2011 to early 2012, uh, this was found by uh, network scans in Syrian computer space. And uh, you can see here, this shows uh, the names of the devices uh, were blue code, which coincides with one of the filtering products that are used. And if we take a look here, uh, we actually see uh, in the last bit, uh, this, the number of scale is much, much higher, indicating that a large amount of traffic that would not coincide with, say, an office or an educational facility where the installation of this might be to prevent employees from you know, accessing certain sites. So this is a case of uh, scanning with being used to find something. Because a lot of these devices, uh, they don't indicate that the regime is being used uh, to filter content because these uh, devices have dual uses. There's a, a lot of legitimate reasons why somebody would buy a blue code device and put it in their uh, place of business, for instance. Uh, so that's an example of just scanning websites uh, and scanning uh, networks to try to find this sort of information. Uh, we can kind of uh, you know, address this, these, these problems by uh, using a scanning service. So one that we've used in past research is uh, Shodan which is a search engine, uh, not unlike Google, where you can search for uh, fingerprints of devices uh, that are just connected to the internet. And here's an example of uh, a search done on uh, Shodan uh, yesterday, uh, which looks for the product NetSweeper, which was found in different countries. And you can see we already have uh, 301 installations in different countries, including uh, the United Arab Emirates, where and the, 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 another way that we can try to find these devices is using public data. So this example uh, is uh, the Internet Census 2012, which is uh, a, a public data set that was undertaken by an anonymous researcher that sought to scan every single public-facing Internet device on the Internet. He did so by uh, using a botnet. Uh, and uh, the, the anonymous researcher had, had stated that even though the, the method that this was undertaken was by a botnet, that they had taken steps such as uh, rate limiting and, uh, and uh, non-permanence so that an infected device uh, upon restart, wouldn't sort of the, the actual botnet code wouldn't restart, but actually provides a, a unique source uh, of, of research data because 
uh, in the late 2012, it shows all the, the internet connected devices and it kind of addresses, the, again, one of the problems with scanning individual hosts because we wouldn't have to scan individual hosts. We have something that we can search by uh, entirely. Uh, other uses of public data uh, that might be a little less common is uh, this. So, I mean, this is a block page that was found in the country of Oman. Uh, the ISP is Omantel, which is the uh, state-owned ISP. And the URL is block.om, and it shows, you know, the site's been blocked to uh, content that's contrary to the laws of the Sultanate. And uh, if we take a look at Alexa, Alexa is a web uh, information company that shows most popular content by countries. So if we look at the top uh, sites in Oman, we see number one is YouTube, number two is Facebook. But uh, and if we go down a little bit, just a little bit below Wikipedia, we actually see the block site, block.om, is one of the most popular sites uh, in Oman. So it's a little interesting. Uh, and another example of where we can use public information to corroborate and, and, and find uh, evidence of filtering. So, uh, here is a sample uh, list that of websites that have been blocked in this country, in India. Uh, and the majority of these sites uh, have been blocked uh, because they were uh, related to file sharing and the, the distribution of uh, you know, Hindi music and that sort of thing. Uh, and I, want, I wanted to use this example to kind of highlight that a lot of the filtering that we see has a lot of unintended consequences. So if we take a look at this, uh, all the URLs are more or less related to uh, file sharing content, and I wanted to highlight this one, which is indiebay.org. Uh, indiebay.org, if you had visited in uh, late 2012, uh, you would get uh, something like this, which says the URL has been blocked until further notice, uh, pursuant to court orders at the directions of the uh, issued by the Department of Telecommunications, uh, which is something I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room has seen. Uh, I just checked it yesterday, and uh, you actually get a blank page. If you kind of look at the source, it doesn't have anything at all. So even the, the very sparse information that you were given in late 2012, you don't get any longer. Uh, the interesting thing about indiebay.org is that uh, it's not a file sharing site at all. Actually, it's uh, an activist kind of site based in the San Francisco Bay region. And I've always thought that the reason they blocked it is they kind of thought it was the Indian Pirate Bay, like Indie Bay, but it's not at all. If you visit it, as I did yesterday, through a proxy, it's just a regular site. And so that's an example of a completely un unintended consequence of filtering. Another one is uh, related to uh, a report that we put out uh, last year, uh, which is uh, we found evidence that uh, Indian block pages were seen in the country of Oman. And after researching this a little bit, we actually found that uh, if you trace route, or if you try to look at the path that uh, an, a user in Oman would do to access content that is blocked, so in this case, he's trying to look for uh, a site that's uh, related to file sharing, you'll see that uh, the file routes through Airtel. Uh, which, so we found that Bharti Airtel was providing uh, upstream internet service uh, to uh, Omantel, and as a result, users in Oman were subject not only to the filtering uh, and controls imposed by their own government, but also that of India. So, re quite recently, the kind of work that we've been doing is we've been trying to identify commercial filtering devices. So, a common problem we'll run into is uh, we have some idea that proxies are blocked in, in a given country, right? And what can we do to determine which product is being used? So, in the past, this was actually really easy. We would just go to the site, the block page, it would just tell you right there. It's like the McAfee smart filter that's being used for filtering. But nowadays, your block page is more likely to be like this, where it doesn't actually tell you which product it is, and it, it tries to obfuscate the actual uh, thing that's being used. They customize the block pages to be for, for a particular thing. So one of the methods we've been playing around with is we create, in this, product, in this instance, uh, 10 domains and 10 proxy websites, completely different. And uh, we check if they're blocked in country X. Since these are newly created sites, these would not be blocked, okay? So we take five of those domains and we would submit them for classification. A lot of these filtering products have uh, websites that you can submit information in order to, so that they can analyze the, the contents of the website and give them category. Since these are, uh, in this instance, it's proxy sites, we would hope that eventually, after some time, these would be classified as proxies. Uh, and then we don't do anything with the remaining five, which kind of uses as a control group. And then we compare the two results. And if we see that uh, for some, you know, it, it, when it hasn't started, nothing was blocked, now all of a sudden only five of those are blocked, but the rest are remain, we know for certain, or we have a very good indication that this product is being used in this country. So we use these kind of techniques to try to determine which products are being used in which country. 
so as a result of this, we had a few uh, you know, res uh, results. We have a uh, Canadian company, uh, NetSweeper, was found to be in Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. Uh, McAfee Smart Filter had used to be involved in uh, Saudi Arabia. And Bluecoat uh, was present in the, in the networks of Syria, Burma, as well as the current, in currently in Saudi Arabia. Now we actually put this out uh, recently on a map. So this map was uh, done by uh, using data from the Shodan uh, search engine to find installations of Packet Shaper, which is a surveillance product, and Proxy SG, which is a filtering product, and to try to find the intersection between installation locations and where it's present. So these are the kind of techniques we've been doing recently, and we'll take that. So, uh, so that's on uh, the use of uh, products for filtering and uh, looking at that market. And uh, another market we've been really interested in is for uh, surveillance technology. So this is a poster of uh, ISS World, which is the premier conference for um, uh, uh, vendors uh, providing surveillance technology. And uh, it's put on by a company called Telestrategies. And uh, recently in the uh, New York Times article, uh, Jerry Lucas, who's the president of Telestrategy, said the market for these technologies has grown to $5 billion a year from almost nothing 10 years ago. So this is a really booming um, area. And you can see some of the topics that are covered in, in this conference, like uh, infected spyware, cell phone investigations, social network surveillance, modern encrypted traffic, uh, and so on. Here's a... Um, slide from uh, the conference showing uh, what talks are about and uh, one of the tracks which is encrypted traffic monitoring and IT intrusion products. Uh, so for the past year we've been really interested in this particular area uh, of these so-called lawful intercept tools. So these are tools um, that are ostensibly used by law enforcement agencies and uh, other government agencies um, in investigations of criminals or terrorist behavior. Uh, and they're provided by another, a, a number of companies. Uh, here you see some of the companies giving talks on this area, including Gamma Group and Hacking Team, uh, which are two companies that we've been looking at closely. Uh, so as I said, we've been looking at this for the past year. This research is led by our colleagues uh, Morgan Marquis Biore, uh, Bill Marziak, John Scott Railton, and uh, a number of others who helped out along the way. So I'll just give a high-level overview of uh, what we found by both looking at these companies, their products, and uh, this wider market for surveillance. Uh, so this is the website for uh, FinFisher, which is a suite of tools provided by uh, Gamma Group, uh, which is based in the UK. And they describe these tools as governmental IT intrusion and remote monitoring solutions. Um, and you can see some of their graphics there. So uh, this company really came into the spotlight uh, following the Egyptian <coughs> revolution when uh, protesters uh, gained control of the offices of state security and um, were able to retrieve a number of confidential documents. So amongst these documents uh, was this, uh, an offer from uh, Gamma Group to the uh, Egyptian State Security Investigation Department uh, for the Finn Fisher Suite. And there you can see some of the unit prices for their tools, uh, one of their products called FinSpy. Um, and uh, there's been a number of brochures and other information that's been circulated about Finn Fisher uh, by WikiLeaks and an uh, organization called Privacy International. That's given a sense of uh, what the capabilities are. So you can see uh, in the corner there uh, discussions of being able to intercept covert communications, uh, full Skype monitoring, uh, tracking targets, extracting files, etc. So essentially, this is the commercialization of the kind of targeted malware that uh, I discussed before. So. Um, a lot of attention suddenly came on to the company after this revelation that uh, the Egyptian government was at least been giving an offer of their product. It's not clear if they ever went beyond this offer stage. Um, at this point in time, no one had a, a sample of, uh, uh, of this product uh, in their research community. So there's still a lot of questions around its capabilities, how it worked, and so on. So in May 2012, uh, Vernon Silver, who's a journalist with uh, Bloomberg News, uh, shared some pieces of uh, malware uh, with our lab. And uh, these samples were uh, emails with malware attachments that specifically targeted uh, Bahraini activists. So uh, you can see above there is an example of what uh, the typical message content was of these emails uh, that was sent in the attacks. 
and uh, the uh, files that were attached to them had malware and uh, that provided remote access to the victim's uh, systems and allowed attackers to exfiltrate data from those systems. So um, Morgan and our colleagues uh, did a thorough analysis of this malware and uh, were able to determine that this malware was likely a fin fisher for a number of different reasons, uh, specifically the fin spy product. Uh, so in debug strings uh, in the infected processes, you can see a reference to FinSpy uh, in the malware. And uh, they were also able to um, compare the samples that we had been shared with from the journalists um, to other samples that had a lot of uh, similar characteristics. Um, and uh, those samples communicated to domains belonging to uh, the Gamma Group. Uh, so we also did some research on a competitor to Gamma Group called Hacking Team. Uh, they're based in Italy. Uh, they sell a similar product called Remote Control System. And you can see um, their promotional material here explaining what the product can do. So very similar to um, the Finn Fisher suite. Uh, so like Gamma Group, um, Hacking Team claimed that their products are for governmental law enforcement agencies and other agencies only. Uh, and you'll see this with a number of these kinds of companies. Uh, they claim their products are only for uh, those clients, that conference uh, that I showed you the slide from. Uh, you're only allowed to attend if you're um, a government representative from the law enforcement community. Uh, some companies have even gone a bit further and claimed they only sell to the United States or allies of the United States. Uh, but this is the uh, this is the claim that these companies have for the sale of these tools, and uh, they're used by uh, various law enforcement agencies around the world. Uh, so this man pictured here, uh, his name is Ahmed Mansour, and he is a democracy activist in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, on the 23rd of July, uh, 2012, uh, he received this message here, uh, which purportedly is from Arabic WikiLeaks, and is urging him to open a very important message um, so the uh, attachment uh, with this message was malicious. And uh, again, uh, Morgan and our colleagues uh, analyzed it and found that it matched the characteristics of the remote control system product made by Hacking Team. Uh, importantly, that product, um, samples of it had been previously discovered in the wild or on the internet uh, by other security researchers that gives an opportunity to compare them. So this was another example of these products being used in countries with uh, questionable human rights records and specifically being used to target uh, activists. Uh, so we've also seen a campaign of the Fin, by, fin Spy tool, uh, part of the Fin Fisher suite, that uses pictures of uh, Jimbot7. Uh, this is the picture that it uses, which is an Ethiopian opposition group. Uh, which has been um, classified by the Ethiopian government as a terrorist organization. And uh, so this picture and content around this organization was used as a lure in the message to have users open um, an attachment that would contain uh, the FinSpy malware. Uh, so this again is another example of uh, FinSpy deployments uh, being used uh, with strong indications that they're politically motivated. And in this example, uh, the instance of FinSpy communicated with a uh, server based in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a more recent example uh, that we found uh, through a service called VirusTotal, um, in which users can upload uh, files uh, to uh, the service, and then it checks how many uh, antivirus um, vendors can detect uh, the file as malicious. Uh, and it also collects all of these samples that security researchers can then use. So um, our colleagues found uh, this file, uh, which is a document uh, that contained FinFisher, and the content of this document is in Malay and has information on the uh, 2013 uh, Malaysian general election. Uh, in this case, uh, we don't know who made this lure or who was circulating it. We also don't know who was being targeted specifically by it or how many users may have been infected by it. But given the content of the document, it's in Malay, it's about the Malaysian election, um, we can conclude that the targets of this campaign were probably Malay speakers who had an interest uh, in the 2013 Malaysian election. 
So uh, other work our group has done on FinFisher is uh, scanning the internet and uh, data sources um, like the internet census data that uh, Jacob mentioned uh, for identifiers of FinFisher. So this is somewhat similar in methodology to how we try to scan uh, for uh, identifiers of commercial filtering products. So uh, this map shows our most recent results of, uh, of that scan. And uh, we've identified FinFisher command and control servers in over 36 countries. So the command and control server is the server that would then send the commands to the infected um, hosts. Uh, our most recent results uh, include finding servers in Pakistan, Nigeria, South Africa, Panama, uh, Turkey, along with other countries. So um, it's important to note with these results that um, just because there's the presence of a FinFisher command and control server in a country does not necessarily imply that the country's law enforcement, security, or intelligence services are operating that server or, in, or are indeed a client of uh, FinFisher and Gamma Group. But this kind of gives you a sense of um, some open questions around why are there servers in uh, some of these countries, um, who is using them, and for what means are they using them. And uh, as we have uncovered through this research, uh, we've continually seen examples of these tools being used in countries with poor human rights records and to target activists. So that was a really quick overview of over a year of research. Uh, if you go to this URL, you can download uh, this report. Uh, for their eyes only, the commercialization of digital spying, which is over 100 pages of technical details of what I just described. Um, this is a very active research area for us. So just to kind of review what we covered uh, in the talk, uh, our main research area right now is trying to understand this spectrum of information controls confronting civil society and whether these be controls that are designed to deny information to users, to manipulate the content of information that is circulated to users, or to surveil what users are doing on the internet. Uh, they all have serious implications uh, for civil society, for international relations, and a lot of uh, open legal policy uh, and technical questions about how these things are operating. Uh, one of the things that we find concerning is a civil society group could have all of these things happen to them at once. You could have your website filtered when you're trying to reach a jurisdiction that's important for you for your campaigning. You could have your social media account compromised and have some messaging on it that's embarrassing to your group or trying to ruin your reputation. Um, you could have your site come under a denial of service attack when you're trying to get information uh, out to your audiences. You could be under pressures of legal and regulatory uh, authorities. Um, and you can also be having your networks and your computers actively spied on by attackers. So we're trying to understand this full spectrum and uh, raise awareness around it and have information that we hope can be helpful for those communities. Um, and to add like another layer around it, there's this whole political economy and uh, commercial market uh, for products that enable these kinds of controls and increasingly we're seeing evidence of them uh, used around, uh, around the world and, and countries uh, with problematic uh, human rights records. So that was just kind of a high level overview of what we're working in the lab right now and uh, really invite questions or comments from all of you. So thanks for your attention. Um, you talked about uh, the implication of a militarized internet on, on the future of the civil society. Now, how are civil society organizations countering these? How are private organizations like Google and civil society, non-profit organizations like Mozilla or W3C, how are they countering these happenings? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think there's different levels of it. Like there's things that individual users are doing to bypass censorship, for example. Um, or like creative use of language to evade censors, so all kinds of technical and non-technical things people are doing at a user level. Um, I think one of the uh, positive implications of having more of this information available and just the, the, the scale of it uh, more visible to um, uh, general audiences is it gives an opportunity for civil society actors and and also government and private sector to really have a conversation around what's happening. And, um, you know, for us, a big touch point in our research was the, uh, the discovery of the GhostNet network in 2009. But since then, it feels like every week there's a new story of a cyber espionage that network that is targeting government or civil society or, or private sector actors or, or all of them all together. Um, so this kind of escalation is, is both concerning, but I think 
provides a, a good opportunity to have um, a dialogue around, around what's happening, which is you know something that we try to facilitate in some of our programming. What role do backdoors in software implementation uh, have? Do they work together or do they happen separately? Or is it all synchronized? Sorry, you mean like intentional backdoors and yes, products? Yes, yes. Um, again, I mean, the, I think it depends on the context of the company providing it and in which country. So, for example, we've done a lot of research on uh, domestic products and services provided by Chinese companies, and um, they are under obligation to implement controls like surveillance and censorship. Um, for example, in 2008, my colleague Nard again uh, discovered that Tom Skype, which is the uh, Chinese version of Skype, was uh, there were suspicions that it was implementing censorship. So if you typed in certain keywords, like say Tibet, Tiananmen Square, user on the other side wouldn't see it. Uh, but Nard was able to find that actually when he typed in certain keywords, not only was it censoring, but it was also uploading entire chat logs to a server based in China. Um, so that could be a kind of an example of a backdoor. And recently we've been working with colleagues at the University of New Mexico uh, who are able to reverse engineer um, the TomSky client. And for the past almost two years now, we've been downloading the keyword list that uh, triggers surveillance or censorship uh, on that client every day. So that's just an example of a product that has been known to be doing these controls since 2008 and is, in, is continuing to do it and uh, is updating these keywords to, to keep up with, with, with current events. And you know, in other, other jurisdictions and other companies, there might be similar controls happening and you know, that's something that can definitely have a huge impact on, on users and, and speech online and all kinds of other legal and policy questions around it. Have you found any correlation between the, the kind of countries which use these products? Let us say, for example, a country which is quite high on economic freedom or political freedom, or countries which are authoritarian with one party rule or where, which have a track record of cracking down dissent. Is there some kind of a relationship which you have found between the country's uh, political or economic freedom and then the usage of the software? Or those things become independent of the, the usage? So that's a really interesting question. I think one of the uh, takeaways from our research is that both authoritarian and democratic countries are using these products. And uh, you know, when we do scans of them, we find them around the world. One of the challenges for us, is, as um, uh, Jacob explained, is, is understanding how a product that can be used for censorship but may also have a legitimate use on a network um, for efficiency and, and other aspects, whether or not it's being used for censorship. And then we can hone in on countries that have um, authoritarian regimes or, or or other issues around human rights to see if they're using it for censorship. Um, for the surveillance products, I mean, they're used by everyone. Um, they're definitely used by democratic states. They're definitely used by authoritarian regimes as well. So one of the issues for us is when these companies claim that these products are being used by law enforcement agencies, if um, they're in a country with a proper rule of law, then they'd be using it under the auspices of warrants and, and other kinds of accountability and transparency around it, um, one would hope. But if they're being used in countries where the rule of law is problematic, um, that can be a, a big issue. Or if they're being used in countries where um, speaking out against the government or, or, or being um, or vocalizing dissent is considered a criminal activity, um, then, then that's another issue as well. So that's the kind of nuance around it that we're, we're trying to explore in this research. So earlier this year, if I remember correctly, there were some articles that came out online talking about the markets for zero-day vulnerabilities mm -hmm. um, and how uh, a lot of governments and government contractors are sort of buying them up and gearing up for cyber warfare or what have you. But I was wondering if the system lab had done any research on those, and if so, um, whether it had evaluated the use of those sort of um, marketized vulnerabilities um, to target like civil society and activist groups as well. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. Um, so in, in, the, uh, in the study I uh, briefly described where we've been doing this collection of samples from civil society groups for over the past two years, I think in that we've seen maybe two zero days. It, it hasn't been a big feature in, in uh, the samples we've been getting. Uh, interestingly, for the majority of targeted malware that we see affecting those groups, the, um, 
the effort on the part of the attackers is on the social engineering. So they're tracking what the groups are doing, they know what they care about, they have like kind of mapped out their networks of groups that they contact with, and they're putting a lot of effort on that. The technical sophistication of the malware is, is usually lower. So for us, again, like FinFisher is kind of on top, these kinds of tools that you can tell are uh, being developed by a professional group and a lot of effort on that. And um, the samples that we see from that, the majority of samples that we see targeting civil society um, don't have a lot of effort into obfuscating what the code is doing or, or protecting it from analysts, um, with the exception of tools like FinFisher. Um, but it's definitely an area that we're interested in. I think you know this market for zero days and so forth definitely is a key part of trying to understand the, the greater surveillance market out there and um, all of these questions of who the clients are, what they're being used for, or what that impact is for the greater security of the internet and other policy questions is definitely something we're interested in. What do you think are some of the stuff done by the ISPs here, other than bandwidth capping, that really hampers everyone? Um, particularly for ISPs in India? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know, Jacob, do you have any comments on that? I haven't, uh, we haven't actually done tests uh, in India since 2011. Uh, so we're hoping to get some more information and learn from, from all of you of what uh, some concerns might, might be there, but... Um, So, I mean, uh, we're really keen to, to learn from all of you of uh, what's happening here and what issues you're concerned about. Any more questions, concerns, comments, ideas? Okay, then uh, we can wrap it up. Okay, uh, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you to all of you for attending. And uh, there's a guest book which I think is going around somewhere. Uh, if you can please take like I don't know, a few seconds just to it in, that will be really great. Um, and thanks a lot. And any feedback, just tend to say yes or just says that.